morning, and thank you for being interested in a very interesting book of the New Testament, a very neglected book of the New Testament, a very misused book of the New Testament. And we've said many things about the book so far in uh, an introduction to this book, and I hope no one is getting excited about, or will get excited about, about us taking our time introducing the book of Revelation, because we're going to do that for a few weeks. I'm hoping that after we do that, you will, uh, you will understand why we're doing that. A book well introduced is a book what? <clears throat> Man, if I had a dollar for every time I've said this, I can't believe you guys can't tell me. Tell me. Or I just can't hear you. I can't hear you. A book? You can't hear me. Oh, okay. okay. A book well introduced is a book has thought. For anybody that doesn't believe that, and if you don't believe that, I want you to believe that after we study this book. Because our outlook on the book, the path that we decide to take, we, I'd like for us to uh, have a team effort on this, the path that we decide to take is going to determine much about the um, our conclusions about the book, uh, it, it will determine a lot about the symbols that we're going to study, and uh, a book well introduced is a book half thought. And some of you came up with some other good things. Is a book, what did you say? Well learned? Understood? Yeah, it works. I just like half thought better because that's what I read all my life. A book well introduced is a book half thought. All right. Tell me some things, just some random things that we've said so far in introduction about the book of Revelation. What have we said? Early days, late days. Okay, there's a difference in the dating method. We'll have more to say about that as we go on in the introduction. There's an early date and a late date. All right, what else? Written in a uh, cropolistic language. Yes. Apocalyptic language. In fact, that's the name of the book. Apocalypsis. That's the uh, that's the original. That's in the original. Now, in our English uh, Bibles, we see Revelation. The apocalypse. And what does apocalypse or apocalypsis mean? Yeah, revealing, uncovering. Yes. And uh, tell me what we've said so far about this uncovering. What's unique about maybe the uncovering of the book of Revelation as opposed to a revealing of another New Testament book? Written to the seven churches in Asia. Okay, if it was initially written to seven churches in Asia. Do you think there were just seven? No. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what I think. Um, we, we'll discuss that a little bit, but don't want to get bogged down in that. Um, what else? What else about um, where, where? Where? Who wrote it? I'll be careful. Who wrote it? Yeah. Who wrote it? Jesus. Yeah, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, isn't it? He's the writer. Who's the penman? John. All right. John didn't have an amanuensis, did he? What does that mean? What's an amanuensis? That's a secretary. That's a scribe. As far as we know, John actually penned it. Um, other New Testament uh, penmen didn't pen it. <laughs> Jeremiah. He had a secretary. He had the room. But anyway, he was in. Where was John when he wrote it? And why was he there? Where was Patmos? Reagan took care of this a week or two ago. Where was, where was Patmos? Right at the tip of Asia Minor. Yeah, at the tip of Asia Minor. About how many miles? About three score and ten. What's that? 
about 70 miles south of, uh, of Asia Minor. What do we mean by Asia Minor? You know, when, I, uh, when we study geography today, we don't hear much about Asia Minor. What, what does that mean? Turkey. And where was Asia Minor? Yeah, in Turkey. In south of Turkey was Asia, Asia Minor. We're not talking about just the continent, the big continent of Asia here. John is writing. John was where? Where was where was he? Patmos. In Patmos. And why was he there? Was he on vacation? He was exiled. Yeah, he was exiled. And why was he exiled there? Speaking the truth. He was speaking the truth. You know, some people say, well, all the apostles died of martyrs' death except John. You need to think about that a minute. You ever been exiled? A couple of times. A couple of times. <laughs> you have issues in your marriage? Why are you exiled? I, yeah, I, I've been there with you. I don't know if you've been in the same place. Yeah. Pardon me? Well, Jack's always one step ahead. Who exiled him? Yeah. Yeah, the Roman Empire did that. And uh, Domitian was in charge who did that. Domitian was known for exiling people. Keep this in mind. Nero wasn't. I'm not going to tell you why I'm saying that. Some of you might know. But um, this persecution was widespread throughout the empire. This was not a limited local persecution like Nero. It, wasn't, it didn't go outside of Rome. It went outside of Rome, not Nero. All right, so uh, he's, he's banishing John to Patmos because of, uh, of his Christianity. What style, again, is Revelation written in? Apocalyptic, but... Figurative. Yeah, figurative. figurative. <coughs> and, and why? There are figurative parts of the Bible. What are some other figurative parts of the Bible? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean more apocalyptic figurative language. Let me put it that way. Right. Which the parables would not be included. It'd be included figurative language, but not apocalyptic figurative language. I'm talking about more of an apocalyptic approach. About uh, uh, Christ saying, eat my flesh or drink my blood. Well, that's not apocalyptic. Oh. <laughs> Ezekiel would be a big apocalyptic figurative kind of book. Yes. I'm thinking more of a general than specific verse. Ezekiel would be one. What's another one? Some parts. What would be some bigger parts? Books that are more apocalyptic. Two more in the Old Testament that I can... Daniel. Daniel. Yes. Daniel. Uh, a lot of prophecy. A lot of uh, figurative language. What other maybe lesser known minor prophet book? Zechariah would be a would be an apocalyptic kind <coughs> of book. Why did John write like this? You know, it seems like human nature. We we like for the Lord. Did, did anybody that uh, labored with the Lord say, Lord, why are you speaking to us? You know, in parables and figurative language, tell us plainly. Maybe that's why some of us stay away from Revelation. Why was the Lord speaking in parables? Why was he not as maybe crystal clear as the apostles wanted him to be? Why did he do that? He didn't want to tell people the news yet. Yeah, it wasn't time for him to be crucified yet. You know, he wasn't ready for every. How many times when he performed a miracle or he met, he gave a teaching, he said, now don't, don't go tell anybody this. And of course, what happened? He couldn't wait to tell the first person. And we can understand that. And there were times when that was a good thing. Right? When the Lord, how about the blind man? And he immediately went and told what was done to him. There were times when it seemed like that was okay with the Lord, but sometimes he didn't want to do that. Because he said, my time has not yet come. Well, it's the same way with the book of Revelation. And again, please notice there's no S on the end of that book. 
It's many acts. You're sitting in a play, right? How, how many times have you gone to a play and there's more than one act and the curtain closes and then opens again? Okay, seven times that's going to be done in the book of Revelation. One revelation, seven different ways of, of showing it. Or John relating it as he's watching the play. This is how you have to think of John on Patmos now. He is writing this as he is seeing a play unfold before his eyes. All right. What else have we said specifically about the introduction? Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, John and his writings and why it was written like it was, he was put on there in exile, the same as being put in prison, because of his communication to people around him. And they would obviously be you know, reading and checking what he's sending. And anything that would be clearly said in teaching the Lord would have been stopped. Right. And his, the message would not have been passed on. That's right. That's exactly right. And you know what we have to do? We have to give credit for, um, you know, and this comes up, and I don't want to go this way very long. I want to come back. You know, you know um, many times why people say, do we have any lost books? How do we know we've got them all? Um, I don't know how many conversations I've been in, and I'm sure you've been in, where the person you're talking to needs to understand and give the Holy Spirit credit for keeping his word together. Heaven and earth will not pass away, Jesus said, right? Or heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will what? Never pass away. Give the Lord credit. When the, when the Lord is saying, okay, don't tell this story yet. Or here John is on Revelation, he's, and he's just writing in this language that we get frustrated about. And, you know, the Lord's doing that for a reason. It's not just your or my frustration that's the issue here. Other more significant things, why the Lord has done this. And we have got to give him credit for keeping his word as it is and even preserved for us down to this very point in time. All right. Here we go. Back, that was review. I want to look at um, symbol particular. Do you have the, the mental picture of our outline? Uh, apocalyptic literature, and then figurative language, number two, and then number three, symbolism. Let's talk about symbolism a minute, specifically. We're going, not only a book well introduced is a book half taught, but going from the general to the specific is what keeps it in there. Starting with what we all know and then building more specifically. That's what we're doing here with the introduction. The symbolism now. Let's talk about symbolism a little bit. Um, is characteristic of apocalyptic literature. Symbols. It is desirable to look more closely at the subject with special reference to the book of Revelation, since it's one of these apocalyptic books. Figurative language is used to express one thing in terms usually denoting something else. So please, when we look at the great dragon, don't think he's a fire-breathing dragon. When we look at Babylon in the book of Revelation, don't think it's the literal city or nation, right, of Babylon. When we look at the... Uh, is everybody over 18 in here? When we look at the great whore of Revelation... Let's not think of a literal woman. We're dealing in symbolism. The bottomless pit, right? We've talked about that. There's not even a, such a thing as a bottomless pit. 
or a spirit being being held, the binding of Satan with a literal chain. That's, that's ludicrous. And when you take symbolism like that and make it literal, especially when it contradicts oh, the first law of hermeneutics, don't ever forget the first law. You always interpret symbolism, you always interpret apocalyptic literature, you always interpret figurative language in light of clear, literal, obvious, unequivocal passages. Not the other way around. Folks, without a doubt, the reason why we have premillennialism in our midst is because of a faulty hermeneutical approach to Scripture. When someone gets up on the Lord's table and they quote the Lord saying, this is my body, we need to understand what that means. We're not transubstantiists. Uh -uh. We don't believe that that's the literal body of Christ. It's a representation of it. When Jesus said he was a door, a lion, a lamb, a vine, surely we understand it in those contexts. Let's not let that crumble when we come to the book of Revelation. And even more so in the book of Revelation. All right? Symbolism. Devour. The word devour. What does the word devour mean? Yeah, it means to consume. Or quite literally to eat up. That might have been a good word to use when we were talking about feasting and fasting a few Sundays ago. Right? Devour. <laughs> The dog devoured his food, we say. The term is used figuratively. On the other hand, in the statement, the flames devoured the forest. They didn't have a mouth like a dog, but it's used figuratively. The figurative use is made possible by an analogy between the action of a dog rapidly eating up his food and flames rapidly consuming a forest. And destroying timber. Figurative language is employed in different forms of expression in the Bible. And it's so important to understand those. How, how do they come to us? In forms of metaphors? In forms of similes? In forms of metonymies? In forms of allegories? In forms of parables? In forms of, how long do you want to make the list? And we can know that. And there might be some premillennialists that might not necessarily, generally disagree with that. But unless you apply it, unless it becomes real in your biblical interpretation, then guess where you're in, where you'll end up? With John, out on the Isle of Patmos somewhere, but without the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Symbolism is not properly one of the preceding categories. Rather, it is a it is figurative language peculiar to apocalyptic and prophetic literature. And employs objects as the symbols. In Revelation, these objects are anything. Here we go. The seven candlesticks of the seven churches. We're going to get into that as we open the book. Do you think those are little candlesticks? Do you think the Lord is going to come down and if they don't remain faithful, he's going to literally take a... Wait a minute. The hand of the Lord, that's not literal either. Because he's a spirit being. You see, if we don't have first century glasses on when we study this kind of stuff, oh, it's amazing where we can end up. And boy, folks have ended up there. All because of this one small, seemingly small area. Candlesticks. Interesting. Creatures. Horses. We're going to read some about horses. We're going to read about the Lord on a white horse fighting the battle of Armageddon. Oh, brother. Why do we hear some of the 
some of the interpretations of that. We're going to read about horses and dragons and living creatures and witnesses and different nations. We're going to read about Egypt along with Babylon. Do you know one nation we're not going to read actually, literally, anything about? Rome. And that's who it's about. Oh, Lord, you mean I've got to study this from a hermeneutical approach and I've got to understand that these aren't literal places? How could you do that to me? I think it was a little more important that John stay alive a little bit longer so we could have the book in order to understand all of this uh, perplexing stuff. Sometimes in apocalyptic language... Not most of the time. Sometimes it will explain itself. And sometimes in figurative parabolic language that happens. Remember the parable of the soils? After giving the parable of the sowers, uh, the Lord, he explained. He explained it. That doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. Sometimes it even happens in the Revelation. The seven candlesticks we're told, are the seven churches. Don't think literally of seven. <laughs> We're going to get into numerology right after we talk about symbolism a bit. But the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. The analogy is seen in the fact that the church is a light, right? You are the light of the world. A light bearer to the world. In contrast, the metaphor implies names instead of objects. So Jesus on one occasion would call Herod a fox. Well, Lord, was he a gray one or a red one? Really? You know, in, 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 in more obvious instances, it's easier to understand when that kind of thing is employed. If, if, if the Lord calls Herod a fox, can you believe the Lord called names like that? My goodness. He calls Herod a fox in a basically less apocalyptic kind of context. We, we get it there. Oh, but when this is all together in a bigger book, then sometimes we want to delve over into the literalism of it. We talked about that in the in, in introduction a couple of weeks ago. Are you a literalist when it comes to the Word of God? Yeah, generally speaking, we interpret it literally. You know, in my in my hermeneutical ear, I don't know about your hermeneutical ear, I'm hearing myself say, yeah, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says it, and I believe it. And that's good up until you get to apocalyptic language. You believe Herod was a literal fox. Most symbolism in Revelation, in the Revelation, comes from the Old Testament. That helps us. When we can look at New Testament figurative, uh, figurativeism, and go back to the Old Testament and see how the prophets use that same figurativism. Like the coming of the Lord. Or the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is seen throughout Scripture and it's different days. And sometimes the day means a 24-hour period. And sometimes not. Now, when you have a text that says evening and morning day one, evening and morning day two, evening and morning day three, you can pretty much come to the conclusion uh, that's the literal day. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. I don't know that that day there is going to take literally 24 hours of time. And you don't either. I don't either. Usually when a thief comes, if the analogy, if the apocalyptic <laughs> idea can be taken this far... I don't know that it's going to take a whole 24 hours for the Lord to come. A thief in the night usually doesn't come. When he comes to your house, he's not usually there for 24 hours drinking a cup of tea with you. He's in and he's out. At least a 
expected. Yeah. I, I don't know that the day of the Lord, if, if things are going to happen, actually, the, the twinkling of an eye, that is in reference to the changing of our bodies. But, point still, still made. The day there may not be a 24-hour day. We've got to understand this when we come to the book of Revelation. So, 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 so important. Most symbolism comes from the Old Testament, and so sometimes that symbolism is taken to a degree that was not intended. And then you have an issue as well. Do you remember in Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the four different kingdoms, the head of gold, the breast of silver, and so forth? And he comes down to the legs in iron of, uh, of, of clay, iron and clay. And then lo and behold, our premillennial friends want to make an allergy between the feet and the ten toes. which the Bible never does. And some make those Tootsies ten rulers. And they end up in a mess in a bottomless pit. <laughs> you can take an analogy too far. And that happens in Revelation as well. Jerry. Do we do that if we refer to the day as the Lord's day? Oh, you want to get into that, do you? <laughs> oh, I'm not going into that trap. <laughs> that can be an example of that. That can be an example. Yeah, the Lord's day. That's the, the, this is the day that the Lord has made. We, that's it's not Sunday. That's every day. Yes. Don't ask another question. We'll, we'll discuss that later. <laughs> <Don't go there. laughs> Most symbolism in Revelation comes from the Old Testament, but many times that symbolism is taken too far. Um, a few examples uh, of that. The woman with child in Revelation chapter 12 doesn't appear to be drawn from any Old Testament symbols, but it's possible that in some instances symbolism originated even outside the Bible. Some of these ideas. And as we said, occasionally they're explained, not usually. Most symbols are left unexplained, which leaves a problem with interpretation to modern readers who can't take off 21st century glasses. It is so important, whatever book you're reading, and that's why introduction to a book is so important. You have got to put yourself in the shoes of those that first received it. Can't leave it there. Then you apply it to 21st century. You and I try to be the first century church in the 21st century. To most ears, that doesn't really compute like it does with us. You know how they hear that? That and let, let you explain it some more. You know how they hear that? Man, why do you go to such an outdated church? Why do you go to such an old-fashioned church? Had this discussion just within the last couple of weeks. <coughs> And we talk about, well, I guess you could say it's old-fashioned. Now, your view positively or negatively of that, we need to discuss it, but I guess you could say it's old-fashioned. Pretty old. It's the oldest religious institution on earth, so I guess it's old-fashioned. Religious institutions since Pentecost. How about that? We'll do that. Um, the context of the prophecy in which the symbols appear <coughs> must be carefully considered. The symbol, for instance, the symbol of Revelation chapter 20 in verse 4. You're going to hear a lot about Revelation 20 in this study. Revelation 20 is the sugar stick for the premillennialists. What do we wait? We better talk about that. You know, see, that's the that's the issue. Sometimes, uh, perhaps this is your first time in the Revelation class, and so I can't always assume that everybody every week understands when I use certain terms. We talk about them. What is premillennialism? It's important to understand this. 
It affects so many teachings in Scripture. What is just many times the definition is in the word itself. Just parse the word. What's pre mean? Before. Before. What's millennium or millennial mean? The millennial generation, the ones that start at a thousand, the year two thousand in this case, but the millennium, a thousand years. How many of you raise your hand if you've ever heard? about a thousand year reign of Christ. If you've heard that even remotely, raise your hand please. Uh, just about everybody. Are you ready to discuss it with somebody? And you don't have to even go to Revelation chapter, that's where they're going to go, that's where they'll take you, but you don't even have to go there. And you know why you don't necessarily have to go there? It ain't there. It's not there. Nothing about, yeah, th th there's a, th there's, given, a, they, they'll reign with Christ for a thousand years, but the thousand year reign as it's presented to us today, it's not even there. <laughs> Folks, the second coming of Christ isn't even mentioned in Revelation 20. Few people know that. <laughs> and other things, but we'll get there too. I'm just giving you an example of this. Uh, those that lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years are said to have part in the first resurrection. Premillennial interpreters consider this a bodily resurrection of the righteous at the beginning of a period called a rapture. You don't have to understand all this now. Believe me, we will get to it. And we will talk about it. But just as, a, as an example of this kind of figure stuff, taken to an extreme. And again, this thousand years, at the end of a period called the Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. And these things are going to happen just before a literal, literal return of Christ on the earth. On David's throne. By the way, how are they going to get him back on David's throne again? Have you ever, have you ever seen David's throne? Some of you just come back. Did you get to see where? Did you get to see David's throne in Jerusalem? Not really. You didn't get to see it, huh? Do they have anything there that kind of symbolizes it? They probably not. I don't, I don't know. Do what? Moses see. Moses see. Oh, Moses sees there. <laughs> But David's throne in Jerusalem is not even existent. I, I guess they could take the approach, well, you know, if the Lord can uh, reassemble our literal bodies at the resurrection, then I guess he can bring back David's throne. I guess, you know, you can go there. But, uh, but yeah, during the thousand-year period, the Lord is going to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign over his kingdom. Do you know that this idea promotes the idea that you're not in the kingdom? You're in kind of a side. The, the, the dispensational, so the seven dispensations has stopped. You're kind of in a time warp right now. You know, because they can't keep the clock going because it messes up their time frame. So you're in this kind of in the, it's like when you send an email or a text at uh, 9 o'clock and the people that you send it to don't get it till 10 o'clock. Well, where did it go? Where was it in that era, in that hour of time? Well, according to premillennial theory, you're in that, that epic of time right now. And hopefully, if you're good enough, you won't have to go through the Great Tribulation. But it's going to be like a purging time, a second chance time for especially the Jews to, to accept Christ. But on and on, this, this image is given to us. But in verse 6, it makes it clear that those who are to partake of this first resurrection shall be priests of God... And of Christ. But Peter tells us that all Christians are priests now. In a more clear, literal passage. Uh, namely 1 Peter 2.5. 
So this suggests that this imagery is not referring to a literal resurrection, a bodily resurrection, but the first resurrection, as we're going to see, you want to know now or you want to know later? That's the obedience to the gospel. That's the resurrection of the watery grave, which we'll, which we'll hopefully see crystal clear through all of the figurative muck. A second hermeneutical principle that is helpful in interpreting symbols is that of analogy. Of analogy. When the meaning of a symbol is well established, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, or even perhaps earlier in the New Testament. By analogy, that meaning may be applied to the figure in Revelation. For example, in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, that verse reflects the understanding that white symbolizes what? Though your sins, you sing it, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? Literal or figurative? <laughs> By the end of this book, I don't think you're going to laugh at me as much when I say something and I say literal or figurative. And if you ever study with these guys that really don't apply this, you're not going to think that this is just a, uh, a, a laborious exercise in understanding this. Are your sins red? And when God operates on your heart to remit those sins, does he do it literally? Is your spirit literal? No, it's not. We should be able to say that quickly and with one accord. <coughs> Is it actual? That's a different story. Is that bell one or bell two? One. 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 All right. It's kind of a symbolism. <laughs> kind of. <clears throat> purity. We understand that white is a symbol of purity. The white horse in Revelation. Robes, garments of white. The white garments of the 24 elders in Revelation 4 and the white throne of judgment. We're talking about purity. Another example is where the beast. Now, I'm not going to tell you who that is yet. We have more than one. I've got less than five minutes right now. We'll, we'll know who the beast is for sure. Of Revelation 13. Both the feet of clay of Daniel 2 and the fourth beast of Daniel 7. Well, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are actually prophecies to be fulfilled in the first century under the symbolism of Revelation 13. So there is a that's eliminating any need for a revived Roman Empire in the future when the Lord comes again. Now, not all three millennials hold that part of it. Because it's so inconsistent. A third principle that guards against any interpreting any symbol in a way that would contradict any literal, non figurative passage elsewhere in the scripture. And this principle can be clearly seen when we take the number 144,000, like our JW friends do. And they teach that this number is the literal number of people going to heaven. And the rest of the good folk get to enjoy a renovated earth where the lion will lay down with the lamb and where one of your favorite singers of the South, Elvis um, <laughs> Presley. Presley, that's it. By the way, I know the preacher who did Elvis' funeral, so if any of you have a question of whether he's really dead or not, I assure you, he is. <laughs> he is. But Elvis sang a song, There Will Be Peace in the Valley, where the lion, well, I wish I could sing it like he did. <laughs> I won't try. 
sing that song unless we give a lot of explanation before we sing it. Because in the minds of most people, that is referring to this premillennial idea. Um, and I heard the second bell. So, it's a feel good song. This lesson must die with Elvis right now. Do what? I say that, that's one of those feel good songs. One of those feel good songs, yes. But sometimes something that feels good may not be good for us. Sometimes. Thanks for your attention, and we'll pick up there, and we're willing next, next.